tức Good morning. We're back. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That means only one thing, Trump week. Uh, many years ago, decades ago, March 30th, 1981, the day that Ro Ro Ronald Reagan was shot, uh, the Secretary of State, General Al Haig, came to the podium and declared the following. As of now, I'm in control here in the White House. General Al Haig mistakenly assumed that he was now in, in control of the government. He forgot the fact that the Constitution had a succession of the Vice President and the ha Speaker of the House would be in control if the President was incapacitated. Uh, we had an Al Haig moment here uh, two days ago where Donald Trump basically said, I'm in control, my authority is absolute, as to when the, the, the economies of each state will open up. And he basically has said that I call the shots. We're gonna talk about this moment in the, uh, the task force pref press briefing with Winston Welch and Stephanie Dalton. Welcome Winston, Stephanie, how are you? Aloha Tim and Winston. Aloha. Well, we had the meltdown. Uh, we had the meltdown in, in the press room and what a meltdown it was. So we'll talk about that and some other things that took place, but let's talk about Donald Trump's, um, if you will, his run up to the borderline of his authority as president of the United States, completely putting disregard to the constitution of the United States. Uh, anyone have any opinions about what we saw two days ago? Well, I was just gonna say, as national correspondents have mentioned, it doesn't appear that he knows the Constitution, much less has read the Constitution closely and understands the, the scope of work that he has. And neither does he understand the demeanor that goes along in that scope of work description. So I think this peeks out every now and then, and this is where it just, thrust its head right out through the whole of his misunderstanding that he has that kind of control. Okay, let me let me tack on to that for a second, Stephanie, because isn't there someone on his staff that knows what he's going to say or has a rough outline of what he's going to say before he goes in front of, uh, you know, to the world in front of many, many cameras and microphones of what he's going to say and how he's going to say it? Didn't someone say, Mr. President, you do not have ultimate authority over 50 states when it comes to lifting um, the stay-at-home orders or opening businesses up for the economy? Well, I, I would just say that that's an excellent question and certainly one that should be disturbing all of us um, in the citizenry. Uh, but I think the evidence shows us that these chiefs of staff have walked out the doors and other advisors who were competent and experienced. So it raises the question as to whether he's listening to any of that, much less taking that advice and, and going with it. So I, I, your question is good and, and, and it's, it's probable answer is very worrisome as to his advice and guidance. Winston, what do you think? You know, 85% of the people that have come in that administration are gone. Is there anyone there? Do we really think there's anybody who's acting and giving him advice he's listening to? Maybe, maybe like hopefully uh, Ivanka, uh, or Ivana would say, Daddy, don't press the nuke button because that you know you'd be nuking France or, or England. You know, I, who knows when he gets get in, gets in a fit. But the, there's nobody there that's putting on brakes. Of course, you have people like Steve saying, Yeah, oh, you can say this. Take the authority. We've read the Constitution. This is our interpretation of it. And uh, the reality is, most Americans haven't read because we. In our, in, our, in our leaders not to abuse um, this idea. So it's really scary time to have 
someone who is saying that he has total authority. Uh, read the Constitution. I have total authority. So, you know, the reality is it, he's done this many times when saying, you know, he could shoot anyone on Fifth Avenue and no harm. Uh, he admires. Uh, he was his people would uh, you know, bow to him like um, or jump up to, to salute him like uh, Kim Jong Il's uh, Kim Jong Un's people, North Koreans, uh, or he likes the president for life scheme like uh, like Putin or um, President Xi in China. It's scary to have an American president saying this stuff. It's it's horrifying, really, um, regardless of the situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at the walk back yesterday. Um, he still couldn't except the fact that he didn't have ultimate authority over all the governors in 50 states. He had to try to mask it by saying, I'm going to give my authority that it's up to them to do their job. Um, I mean, what an embarrassment. What an embarrassment to the world. What an embarrassment to all the, you know, all the people that live in this, in this country of the president who doesn't even know his Civics 101 lesson. And then when he's caught red-handed not knowing what he's talking about, he still tries to walk it back given the impression that he still has the authority over all, all these. Um, I, I don't know what to say. My jaw dropped uh, two days ago when he took the authority, and then my jaw dropped to the ground when he tried to cover it up that he didn't have the authority. Uh, you know, Stephanie, tell me this is embarrassing. Tell me that's not my perception, that this is a worldwide, international embarrassment. And it's also terrifying. I, I think that he is having it making every effort to have it both ways and depending on his his talent for spinning and re-narration to bring it around that way. But I think that he's um, come up against something that um, notice he hasn't much attacked it, but it's like Governor Cuomo with his promise over the television to not fight back, but to be a leader. And uh, what he's doing is presenting a model of leadership for his state and then for his region. So uh, what's happening is he's presenting to the American people um, the, the competence of a governor and a governor who is truly a leader showing how our real leader, our presidential leader is not up, up to that, that model at all. So hopefully there might be, uh, you, ordinarily that might be a learning curve for a president to, to look and see and learn from other his colleagues, but I don't know that that's gonna happen, but at least um, it shows us that we're right when we, we see something that doesn't quite meet the mark of our expectations, because there's others out there who do, and we can look at that and see what's the discrepancy and where he's not filling the bill. Right. You know, Winston, um, our Republican friends, our Senator friends, they seem to be pretty quiet about this embarrassment of Donald Trump's um, brash and bold attempt to uh, usurp his authority over uh, 50 states. Um, we haven't heard much from them. Why do you think that is? Yeah, Tim, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know where the Democratic leadership has been. It's like I said, the Republican um, leadership has been absent. There is no Republican leadership anymore except to do the bidding of Donald Trump. Uh, but I, I don't know why I don't know where Nancy Pelosi is or um, or Joe Biden. And maybe they're just letting things stand on, on these statements. The media has been excellent in calling it out. I think people are realizing it for what it is. I, I, you know, actually, we did see um, even um, Senator Rubio got up and said, actually, these are not powers that the president has. You had Lynn Cheney um, standing up. So maybe the Democrats are just letting a couple of Republican outliers who still have a vested interest in the future of the country uh, after uh, Donald Trump is gone, um, standing up and saying something. And the Democrats didn't have to when the Republicans are standing up and say something. They probably do. I mean, you have people saying things, but really the Democratic leadership has been uh, remarkably quiet on a lot of stuff lately. So um, I'm not sure what to make of it 100%. Well, I know something's shifting because um, some of my neighbors are, are very steadfast Trump supporters and they wear their mega hats quite often um, around here, around by where I live. And uh, this subject came up and, and the one, one of my Alabama? neighbors said, well, no, I'm here in Honolulu with you, <laughs> you would think. And so the bottom line is I heard the comment, Donald Trump was a day late and a dollar short. So for me, to hear that come from this individual, um, that that says a lot to me, because um, like I said, he's pretty steadfast in his support 
for Donald Trump. Let's go back to that, um, that press conference and let's talk about his attempt to revise history with that video. Uh, quite a shocker to see him basically hijack the task force press briefing and turn it into his own propaganda uh, spin. Any, any uh, observations from that whole debacle? Well, I Stephanie? was just, well, I, I just thought to say that even the Republicans are criticizing him for the way he's using that precious time. He's turned it into a two hour rant. And, uh, and I think not all of it is uh, appreciated even by his party members. So um, I think at one level, people have backed off with responding or giving feedback because his punishment is so huge and he'll select to go with that attack and, and, and consequences for those who question him or, or criticize him. So I think people are, are backing off doing that in order to spare all the rest of us and themselves the time um, that he would put into that kind of a, a counter attack. So um, I think that uh, he would be well to, to re be reflective about the feedback he's getting from his own party members about uh, the benefit, you know, what, what he's doing with those, those statements and, and what, what, what kind of import those statements have for the people. And uh, the people are those that are gonna bring him back if he wants to try and get back. Winston. You know, as, as, when you have Lynn Cheney and, and Marco Rubio saying things, it's important that that they're they, they don't speak up often. You hear very little. But like Stephanie says, when you go against this fellow, you are beaten down. And there's not a lot of people that will come to your rescue, especially inside of the Republican Party. I mean, look what happened to Mitt Romney um, recently. I, it's um, it's astounding to see this happen in our nation, where we have what I have thought are really great leaders. We don't have to agree with them on, on, on all the policies, but to step up for our basic institution of, of democracy and reining in a, a person that has shown zero um, ability to want to control his uh, impulses, power, megalomania, it's scary. Uh, we, need, we need many voices to come up if they're going to come up at all. It's, this is the time, and they did, and then he backs down you know, he goes right up to the edge, sees how far he can push it, and then comes back down. Um, it's a pattern that we've seen over the many years that he's been in office, and it, it is frightening. It's frightening that uh, that everyone's not joining in. But I was happy to see the reporters not letting up, not relenting. Sadly, I think what we're going to see is a very diminished um, White House over time in the future. They're going to have to put in new strictures that never allow this to happen again uh, because of the abuses that we've seen over the last four years. Yeah. Um, speaking of, is, you know, the, the bright glimmer of these task force press, press briefings is Dr. Fauci. And so on, it upset me when uh, Donald Trump sent a, a tweet. He retweeted basically a call to fire Dr. Fauci. Um, I'm not sure why he did that. Uh, maybe this is Donald Trump's signature of trying to uh, saber rattle and try to intimidate people that don't say what he wants to say when he wants to say it. But on Monday, he was asked by a reporter what was behind him retweeting the, the, um, the message that Dr. Fauci should be fired. And Donald Trump brushed it off and just said, well, it's just an opinion. And what's the big deal of why I put it up there or not? Um, Dr. Fauci is the only stabilization of this administration when it comes to the, corona, the, the COVID-19 response. And if he goes, where are we going to be? Um, any, any thoughts about Donald Trump's saber rattling about firing Dr. Fauci and what it happens if Dr. Fauci were to leave the administration? Well, I would suggest that Dr. Fauci beware because I think that there will be consequences. All of the previous behavior, the pattern is, there are consequences, if not firing Dr. Fauci, something else is going to happen. The NIH budget's going to be cut or his institute at the NIH is going to find itself bereft of a leader or budget. Something is going to happen and I think that we ought to be aware, of, take a look at that, do some monitoring of our own because that is his pattern and we value what this expert has to guide the nation. 
the nation's policy. So we should be responsible and take a look at that and be on the alert to be able to respond in whatever meager ways we have. But as a, as a larger group doing it, it, it might be helpful. But there will be a response. There will be consequences for Dr. Fauci because he has spoken on the facts and the data. And that is not anything that uh, Trump, uh, Mr. Trump is, is gonna approve of. He only wants to hear his own opinion slash policy uh, reflected back to him. So I would say Dr. Fauci's in jeopardy. Wow. Okay, Winston, what do you think? I think I think he's trying to get fired when he says uh, he walked it back and somehow <laughs> and said, "Oh, it was a bad choice of words." But you know, then he followed it up. The things are really rainy. So I just thought, you know, what what it is is. There is no, he, everybody here's administration has had to walk on tiptoes or, or, or fill in the blanks when he says we're going to, you know, quit NATO or whatever, whatever bizarre proclamation is made. Then they say, well, actually, we're not quitting. We're, we're just going to reassess things or whatever. So um, they do, you know, the question is, is, is it better to be on the inside and try and mitigate the harm and save as many people as you can standing behind Donald Trump or is it better to just say, I can't do this anymore. I have, you know, it, it's very hard for these people. I have sympathy for them, um, for the, the people that are actually really sticking in it uh, for this. But who knows if he quits, let's write the tell all book. And he may be the advisor then to the new, you know, uh, sub grouping of states in the Northeast corridor in California for their um, quasi, you know, federal response to the virus, because that's what it looks like where we're going to. Yeah. Your comment about whether it's more effective to stay on the inside and help out as best you can is been repeated. Um, if I recall General Mattis, that was his exact rationale of why he hung in there as long as he did, just because he thought he could do more on the inside than watch the train wreck from the outside. So um, we'll see what happens with Dr. Fauci. It's, I think from, a, from the nation's standpoint, we want to make sure where we all hope that he stays and is able to try to talk sense to the president before the president goes off on the microphone in front of the cameras with something that's completely erroneous about the COVID-19 virus. So, okay, well, let's leave this one for a minute. I, I wanna talk about the checks, the money, the money that's being deposited in millions of Americans' accounts right now, the, the $1,200 or the $2,400, depending on uh, if you're a couple or you're a single individual. But for those poor people that don't have um, automatic deposit, they're gonna get a physical check and they probably need it more than anybody else because they don't even have a bank account for it to be automatically deposited. Isn't it something that Donald Trump insists that his name must be printed on an IRS check before it is sent out? And how many days does that delay it? And to what extra hardship does Donald Trump put these poor individuals in a position because his name has to be on the check? And this reminds me just while I'm on a roll Reminds me of going into the Trump Hotel a couple years ago, three years ago, and um, in the bathroom on the toilet paper rolls, Trump's name is embossed on every new uh, toilet paper roll, a gold embossed name Trump on his toilet paper. So be it toilet paper or IRS checks, his name has to be on it. What do you guys think? Campaign stunt. It's a campaign stunt, but I, I'm glad you brought up the fact that most people have direct deposits, so won't really see the check itself. The people who do have to see it are the the most in the most dreadful circumstances, and then have to carry it around and get to the bank or do whatever they're going to do to get the money. So, if this is an outreach to the most affected, um, is that any sign that there's some empathy or anything? I find it it, it it's really execrable. I can't even think of the word uh, to describe such a campaign stunt that will affect those people that are most needy and will have to physically handle that check and actually deal with that. So um, I, I, if we look at it from the positive side, that then maybe, you know, they'll think that he is trying to do something for the most needy. I mean, I think that with the people who stay in the administration, in order to work from within rather than stand outside and, and uh, decry it, um, within, there's a chance that maybe another day goes by that those people who are 
who are going to be most affected by his policies, like this World Health Organization uh, on funding. I mean, all the people that will go without food and, and livelihoods and be able to survive by staying in, if you can postpone that in any way, maybe that's another way of thinking about it, that it saves uh, some suffering, in, in this case, in the world, uh, with the checks yeah. we're talking about national situation but yeah it, it's deplorable deplorable yeah hey winston do you think this is a campaign stunt or is this just another stroke for donald trump's ego oh it it's both <laughs> but uh, it's both. Uh, I, okay. I, stephanie is a has a charitable um interpretation and i'm 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 often charitable uh, but i you know you think about this this is the same man that sent Part the other day, uh, Donald Trump's message about uh, the coronavirus. Who has the history of just the coronavirus is, um, and the, the failings and the, the the missteps. And then he sends out a letter to everybody saying, "This is what you're supposed to do when he's going to maybe to try and force the economy open early, so that his uh, reelection chances are better uh, at the risk of health." I mean, it, it's so. Um, it's really just insulting that he couldn't just have whoever the, the, the secretary of the treasury is probably acting interim temporary uh, secretary of the treasury as everybody else's administration, but couldn't they sign it? Couldn't the CDC um, uh, or the, even the Surgeon General sign that like uh, C. Everett Coop did with the AIDS um, uh, pamphlet that came out uh, under Ronald Reagan's term? It's just this sort of megalomania that you have to, like when you mentioned the toilet paper thing, you're just thinking, who would want their name embossed on toilet paper um, unless it's Georgia Pacific or, you know, the, the, the maker of it. And even then, uh, it's astounding. You know, end of the day. Well, you well know, that's a I rhetorical think... question. We all know who wants to have their name embossed on toilet paper. <laughs> toilet paper. So. Well, you know, I, I was, uh, what was I going to say here? That um, he's in the memo line. So the, the appropriate officials are signing on the real lines oh, where you is sign. that what it is okay. it's a memo oh, yeah. but the funny thing about that whatever is it is Peter cartoon or one of the comedians talked about when you see his signature it looks like an ekg that is going completely out of control up and down and up and down in the dark so i think that there may be some mirth for these people that have to carry around yeah. these checks that's All right, let's true. go to the hard question. We're, we're, we're almost out of time, and let's go to the hard question. What happens if this economy is opened up too early? What happens if people are going back to work too early and there's a second wave of the COVID-19? And to what degree will Donald Trump take responsibility by trying to open things up too early? And do you buy his argument that it's going to be up to all 50 governors versus him trying to exert his pressure and influence on those governors? Uh, start with you, Winston. Uh, you know, he, he won't take any responsibility. That, that, that's, that question is like, uh, that's a non-starter it, it, for anything. He will never accept the responsibility of the blame. He just wants all the, the power and the glory. Um, but as far as responsibility goes, he wants to get credit for, for getting the economy back on track. I get it. People are hurting right now. They, the economy needs to come up in the best, most logical way that it can, but it has to be science-based because this is a science-based issue here. Yes. There's a lot of pain. It's 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 emotional, but at the end of the day, you open it up too soon, you're going to end up where Singapore or China or um, Taiwan are. So these have to be these are locally created decisions. You still have some states that just barely have shut down um, that are right in the center of the country, you know, the Iowa and the Missouri. So I would say uh, it has to be local. If he tries to blackmail the states and say, I'm going to cut off your funding or you won't get uh, money for highways or whatever it is, uh, stimulus funds, that will backfire tremendously. So I think on this one, he did come back and say, well, I have all the authority, but I'm going to, uh, the governors can, we can talk about it. And so it, it's his way of saying that, uh, you know, he realizes it's not going to happen. I, that's my, that would be my guess. Okay. Stephanie. I believe this is a prime or the hugest example of his self-interest and his placement of self-interest above <clears throat> the health uh, and the survival of the people of this nation. If he is not using the data uh, and the information from the, the scientists and the experts 
he is reckless and he's reckless with our lives because as he would open us up early and we are in any way subject to reinfection or a resurgence or a surgeons, the second surgeons, we are uh, in dreadful circumstances that um, will not be ameliorated because until that uh, uh, immunization is ready, uh, that will give us another year of, of death and uh, destruction. So I, I think it's, it's a very, we're facing a cataclysmic situation here. And uh, if this is, uh, uh, so we, we all need to be attentive and uh, respond as best we can um, and hope that those who are in positions of influence can exert some somehow on him to pay attention to yeah. the data, the expertise, well, the information, the facts. Well, that's what Donald Trump said he was going to do. He is going to you know, listen to the experts. He said, I'm going to listen to a bunch of people. I, I listened to 35 different people, he said I, a couple of days ago. So, um, but a part of listening to people is looking at the data. And again, the, the virus doesn't care about the economy opening up. And so if they're looking at the data, who's on Donald Trump's shoulders whispering in his ear? Uh, we know that Dr. Fauci's one of those on his shoulder whispering in his ear, but who on the other side is trying to force him to open this economy up too fast? Is it is it Treasurer Mucha, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Lawrence Kudlow or you know, who is it on the other side that's trying to push things forward? I, you know, do you have any sense of that? Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors is an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, are, are that, that's opening it up. It's Mnuchin and uh, President Boeing or United and, and, and the kids are in there too. It, although that was walked back, I'm not sure what that is. So, you know, there's vested interests here that want to get things going um, that maybe you're putting uh, the dollar before health, but We'll see where that goes. I, I'm imagining that the states are going to vote with their feet and corporations will vote with their feet too, unless they are absolutely blackmailed. People are not going to be sending people out anytime soon when you've got literally thousands of people dying still right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, with, Winston, that is the operative point. That is the operative point, Winston, that the consumer will ultimately decide when this economy is going to take back on its feet again and move forward. And all the uh, political wishful thinking in the world isn't going to make a difference. Uh, Stephanie, you wanted to say something. I did just want to say, I'm glad Winston brought up the council that, that uh, President Trump has put together. Um, I have seen that there's a, a statement that there's no one with any expertise on that council uh, ha having to do with the case, the case of the virus. There's no one on that council that can look to the issues of science and the disease itself. And it's likely, um, you know, trajectory from there. So that that's very unnerving, again, for the, the same reasons of putting us all in mortal danger. So I think we need to watch it as we go. And if there's any influence, and then to, to all of these 35 advisors, Yes, everybody can yammer on and talk to this person, but he has to do something internally. He has to, to, to do some critical thinking and he has to do some, some addressing, a changing of the way he's thinking about things. And I don't, I don't see there's any evidence that anything ever happens that way. There's influence on him, but he is not changing. So he listens and then he doesn't change. He goes ahead and does what he's doing. It looks like that because he's got the best influence in the world. And I yet to see that he's employed it and or applied it. So well, um, Stephanie, you Stephanie, you mentioned critical thinking and Donald Trump in the same sentence. In my world, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> so, OK, we've run out of time. <laughs> We've run out of time. I promised you this week was going to be a wild week. It, it wasn't disappointing. It was a wild week. So count on next week to be even as wild or more wild. And I want to thank you, Winston, for appearing on the show. And Stephanie, thank you very much for appearing. And we'll see you next week on Trump Week. Aloha. <laughs>